So uh, if I started doing this about 10 years ago, and if you told me 10 years ago when I started doing this that in 10 years in California, most um, private insurance, Medi-Cal, and actually recently Medicare would start to cover hormonal, medi medical, um, mental health, and surgical care for trans people, I would have thought you were nuts, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but it's actually been happening in the past two to three years, and certainly, you know, to, to the extent that insurance covers everything, which is not always easily or without a fight or without a lot of appeals, but, but it is happening. And I've had to present the case both on an individual level for patients who need care from a particular uh, insurance provider, but then also um, on sort of a more broad sense when advocating with individual plans and providers as to why this is medically necessary and why specific things are medically necessary. And it comes down to two things. One is that this is medically necessary to treat the dysphoria, and that's the kind of obvious one. But the other one is that, you know, transgender people need this care a lot of times, especially hormones and surgery, so that they can navigate society safely as they lead authentic lives, right? And, and that is, if, if a trans person, because of lack of hormones or surgery, isn't perceived by others as the correct gender in society, um, it not only makes their dysphoria worse, but it also makes them vulnerable to discrimination in employment and education and housing, and as well as harassment and interpersonal violence and murder. You know? um, and, and this is at tremendously higher rates than, than cisgender populations. And the brunt of this is borne by trans women, as we saw with the last slideshow, right? And as we'll hear more of when we read the names, this disproportionately affects trans women, and everybody in this room knows why. And it's because trans women are much more likely to be visibly trans, that is, to be out in society and have people realize this is a transgender person. Um, and when you do that, you get a target painted on your back, you know? The, you know, and I, I found when I've been making these arguments that that's actually the single most compelling argument that you can make. Um, the, the same reason that we're coming here tonight to remember our dad. And to be honest, it's actually working, you know. Um, and, it, you know, this isn't to say that, that being out is bad, you know, as Sage told us, being out is, is necessary. But being out should be something that you choose to do not something that you have to do because society says your medical care isn't important or isn't necessary or is, is you know, they just don't like it because it's icky. That's, that's not an okay thing. So when I remember the women and the men who've been murdered and who've ended their lives because they tried to live their lives authentically, you know, I remember that we have to continue fighting this and that you know, every transgender person as a, as a basic human right needs the medical, the surgical, and the mental health care to lead their authentic lives. And the, the sort of necessity for this is ongoing and, and I would love for the battle never to, never, or to, to be able to see an end, but I, I don't see that totally happening, but I think there's a tremendous amount of work that we can do now and in the future to assure that, that this happens less and less.